Okay, we are going to get started, um, but I'm going to do an intro here. So there'll be a couple minutes for you to trickle in here at the beginning. Um, so hi, I'm Josh, uh, Joshua Selesnik. Um, I work here at XBM and uh, this slide has some of my credentials here on it so you can kind of get to know me. Um, so I'm a personal development coach. I've spent uh, many years kind of like coaching and being coached in various programs and am interested in individuals growing in their own, uh, kind of in, in their own path and their own self-fulfillment. Um, I also am a safe certified scrum master, so very familiar with the principles of agile um, and run a couple of teams with, with scrum mastering, uh, kind of the sprint formula. And I am a Myers-Briggs certified facilitator. That's what MBTI stands for. So if you've ever gotten a Myers-Briggs uh, test and result, um, I facilitate discussions about that. I don't always, like I'll administer the test sometimes, but my real interest is in kind of digging into what those things might mean um, for you and others around you to help people work well together. And lastly, I'm a game master, which I use for team building. I have a handful of games that I use, uh, specifically tabletop role-playing games. And I'll get into what that is uh, a little bit later here. It's one of my trust building tools. Um, but that is kind of what I do. And my goal with this talk is because I have a lot of experience dealing with, with uh, teams and team building to impart on you some key things that you can do uh, as a manager of your team in order to be able to um, get the best results on a human on a human level from people. Um, and specifically today's talk is about how to build trust, how to use it to be able to give people feedback and have them really listen to you um, when you give it. Um, how to have people trust the direction that you want to take your projects in um, and have your team basically have faith that you're going to make the project work and that getting behind you is, is worth doing for them. Now, now teams are obviously going to do that, you know, no matter what. I mean, you know, there is the boss mentality that a lot of us come to this from. Um, and uh, I'm kind of talking about this in, in more of like a, more of like a authentically building trust with folks. So um, that's the goal of the talk today. Uh, this talk is being brought to you thanks to XBM, a Valiantis company. XBM is kind of one of Valiantis's brands. And uh, at XBM, we are a team of consultants who work in getting the most out of your JIRA instance. Um, that can look like anything from configuring your instance to working with you on governance and policies and helping implement it across uh, the board. We also teach teams how to use Agile um, as, a, as kind of a methodology. So we help structurally and train people in that method. Um, and lastly, we are a team of full stack developers. Um, so we can do a lot of custom solutions um, for your specific products and for your specific instance of JIRA. Um, so that's it. And we are a platinum solution partner of Atlassian who makes JIRA and Confluence um, and lots of other tools, Bitbucket. Um, and as a platinum partner, that means we work very closely with them and we're um, you know, well regarded in that world. So let's talk a little bit about us as a company here. So I sort of jumped in. This is a picture of XBM's office and uh, yeah, you can take it in. It's quite pretty. Um, it's like got, uh, you know, it's on a St. It's in a St. Louis office building on the third floor, um, and it's our little home. Um, and we have a fairly small company, and everyone knows each other um, when we're working here. Although uh, we've expanded a bit since since then, but this is still our office. Um, and one thing that works really well for our company culture is. Uh, the, the ease of meeting and exchanging ideas, um, the ease of building off of each other. And if we wanna pivot and try something new, we can be very quick in doing that um, and very supportive. Um, and that was one of the things that sort of drew me to XBM as a company when I first joined. Um, and I think a lot of people report it as something um, that's been very positive. But um, I tell you this because 
we struggled when the pandemic hit to be able to maintain that particular company culture. Um, the, the, um, what we had built as a company um, in terms of uh, how people related to each other and, and what we, what we did for one another sort of disappeared as everything went remote. It became harder and harder to maintain those relationships and having that lunchtime when we were all together. Um, it, with that missing, it felt like our culture of collaboration started to sort of fade away. Um, and that was a really big problem for us. And we wanted to go in and try and solve that and kind of rebuild those relationships and rebuild um, what, you know, what could be possible for us. So we did some research and we ended up turning to a book. Um, you might be familiar with this. This is The Five Dysfunctions of a Team uh, by Patrick Lencioni. And it deals in these five particular dysfunctions. This might not look totally relevant to you um, like immediately, like, why would I, why would I care if I learn about these five dysfunctions? What's, what's the purpose? The purpose is in getting the most out of your team. And it all starts with this foundation of trust. Essentially, if team members trust each other, they start to be more willing to collaborate with each other on ideas and kind of go with whatever each other suggesting. Um, a team that experiences a lack of trust will find they meet much more resistance when trying to make changes to, um, to how they do things or how things are set out. Uh, it's going to be much more difficult to feel like you can question leadership uh, for fear of being perceived poorly or for fear of kind of unhealthy or unproductive conflict that, that could happen. So most people will sort of withdraw, stay quiet, do what's expected, but sort of quietly become disengaged. You might've experienced this yourself or know what I'm talking about. It can be a very serious problem on a team. That's not to say that a team that lacks trust can't get things done. It's completely possible to do so, um, but it does not make you as powerful as you could otherwise be. Um, so as kind of a specific example of what I'm talking about in terms of the use of trust, think about if, if someone who you did not trust in your life was giving you feedback about how you were doing something, would you be likely to incorporate their feedback? Maybe they have some sort of threat of force, like if you don't do it, then your job's on the line. Well, that's a different situation. If that's the case, you might incorporate their feedback, but not ultimately be happy with it. But let's just say that you just don't trust them and they're coming to you and offering some solutions. You might hear them out. You might try and get something out of it. You might even go back to a friend and say, what do you think of what they said? But all in all, you're probably going to feel less likely to want to incorporate any of that feedback. And as a manager, if you're wondering, well, why aren't my employees taking on my feedback, you can start to ask yourself, well, do they really trust me? Do they really believe that I have their best interests at heart and that what I'm going to do is going to work out for them? Alternately, imagine someone in your life that you really do trust. And when you sort of hit a decision point or a place where you're unsure, if you go to them and they give you advice, are you willing to listen? Even if that advice is poorly delivered, even if it's emotional or difficult, you might take the time after some debate and argument to really hear what they have to say and incorporate it because with that foundation of trust, it almost doesn't matter how the thing is said. Even if the other one says things very well, uh, the one that you don't trust says things very well, you still might be unwilling to listen to them because there's that thing that's missing. So that's one key thing that I want to give you as a manager in terms of if you want to get the most out of your, like the, the, if you want your employees to do what you want or what you see is best for the company, having their trust is absolutely key. And that's why this, this slide that we have here is from scaled agiles training uh, when they're when they're talking about going agile and teaching the foundations of Scrum, this is one of the first slides that they show people. 
essentially the teamwork, the ability to have genuine teamwork is the ultimate competitive advantage. And many teams are dysfunctional and unable to do that, which in a sense is very good for you. Because if you are able to employ genuine teamwork, then you're going to have a huge advantage over teams that don't have it. And absence of trust is the key problem that leads to all the other dysfunctions. <laughs> That's kind of why it's on the bottom of this pyramid, because you're really not going anywhere if people don't trust each other. And that's what we were starting to find at XBM as we were bringing on new hires and we didn't have a great sort of onboarding process. Um, we found that it was just people were less likely to sort of know and trust one another. And this was a real issue for us um, because that trust was so key back when we were all together. Um, so the, the book uh, basically starts with uh, an executive named Catherine coming into a very dysfunctional executive team. She's been hired as the CEO for this executive team and she takes them to an offsite. Many of them don't wanna go and they're just like, oh my God, why do we have to be here? We have real work to do. What about our clients? I have the sales meeting. How on earth do you think that this is a priority? So the room is very tense when she says the line that's up here and she addresses them at the beginning of the meeting. She says this, we have a more experienced and talented executive team than any of our competitors. We have more cash than they do. Thanks to Martin and his team, we have better core technology and we have a more powerful board of directors. Yet in spite of all of that, we are behind two of our competitors in terms of both revenue and customer growth. Can anyone here tell me why that is? Silence. That silence that you are hearing at the end of that statement is a lack of trust in action. She has asked a real question that might involve some disagreement about what the actual source is. Why are we behind our competitors? I'm sure everybody has opinions about why they are behind their competitors. And it might, some of those opinions might be blaming each other. They might feel that it's not their fault, but someone else's fault. If that is the case, they will be unwilling to engage in conflict because they know that doing so could be very unproductive, very stressful and unhealthy and possibly start to result in tit for tat and people taking resources from each other. Really, really bad dysfunctional activities. So everyone remains quiet at her statement. I just wanted to draw that out to sort of let you know the cost of having a lack of trust on a team. So we've covered a little bit that teamwork is the ultimate competitive advantage. Many people are dysfunctional simply by nature. It's just kind of what happens. Um, we're all human and we can fall into these patterns of blame and distrust very easily. So if a team is able to overcome that and achieve real teamwork, we have found A, that means you retain top talent because everybody wants to work there. People want to work at a place that they trust. Um, and B, the team is capable of more because if one person has an idea and the team trusts it, they can all very quickly run with that idea and bring it to life. That is such a key part of, a, of, a, of an agile team, a team that wants to go agile if they have that trust as a foundation, then they can move on someone's ideas. And if they don't have trust, the whole system is gonna break down. People might not even trust that agile is the right thing to do and they might phone it in for weeks or even months. So if you want your company to be agile and have all the advantages that come with it, teamwork is just key. When people trust each other, they also implicitly understand each other on a deeper level, and they'll know how to leverage each other's strengths, and they'll be more comfortable covering for each other's weaknesses and saying, no, 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 don't worry about it. I got you. I know what you need. Don't worry about it. That feels good, and that builds trust on both ends. They can work also in their zone of genius. Teams that trust each other tend to show appreciation more. And so when someone does something that is truly brilliant because they're just naturally very good at it. Everyone else will rally around and say, wow, we're so glad that we trusted you with that. You did amazing. And that person's going to feel validated. They're going to continue to, to deliver 
like high performing levels of work. They're going to feel inspired to go above and beyond and they're going to want to stay because they're able to express their creativity, their their um, their specific gift, whatever it is. Uh, I like the word creativity because um, that can fall into a lot of different categories. Um, but everyone has particular strengths, whether it's finance or marketing or sales or what have you. Um, so they get to operate in their zone of genius. And then people also get this excellent sense of purpose of being a part of something greater, knowing that they're doing it kind of for each other and for each other's success can be a really powerful motivator for a lot of teams. Um, and they can feel supported to accomplish big things. So if someone does have a vision, not just one that's going to solve things in the short term, but one that might be a year or two years long with a team that trusts them, they can do, people can get behind that and throw their resources behind it. Um, I remember when I was hired here, um, uh, our CEO, uh, Michael McNeil was talking with me. And he was saying, Josh, I, I, I can see that you understand the kind of leadership that, that there are two types that, that can happen. Um, in one of them, you're able to cast a vision out into the future and other people become inspired and they follow you uh, on it of their own accord. The other kind is to cast a vision and then whenever people step out of line from your vision, you sort of reprimand them or, or punish them or get them back in line. That's not really what we're looking for here. Um, so given that, um, you can start to have teams that develop leaders that are more of kind of the visionary, that are the kind of like first category. Um, one of the foundations of Agile is that um, you have self-motivated, ah, build projects around self-motivated individuals or around motivated individuals, which is to say that if you have someone like that, you can sort of send them on their way. And it could look different for every single team, but as a manager or leader, whether you're a scrum master or something else, when you notice that someone has that genuine excitement, is your, that, that for a project that would be good for the company, are you able to capitalize on it? Are you able to empower them to accomplish it? Does the team rally around them? If not, there might be a lack of trust and you might be, it might be costing you that person's investment and in their ideas. So we've talked a little bit about a lack of trust, this sort of like turned away from each other, angry, unable, both blaming each other that can happen over disagreements and be um, very toxic for a team. Um, and you could look at a very simple story, say you have two consultants, a senior consultant and a junior consultant who are going over what they're going to do for a client and they're just getting to know each other. And as the senior consultant is laying out things for the junior consultant to work on, um, the junior consultant might be afraid or worried that they're taking on too much, but be unwilling to say anything about it. So sort of starts to take on the stress of, all right, I've got to do everything. And the senior consultant sort of unwilling to, to listen or be particularly concerned with the junior consultant's experience might just keep on giving them things to do. Eventually a time comes, there's a deliverable for the client and it doesn't happen, which is infuriating for the senior consultant. And then the junior one gets upset too, because they're like, well, you just gave me too much work to do. And you get into this very sort of negative pattern where they're both blaming each other. Um, and, and that trust sort of evaporates in that, in that very moment, um, kind of going from neutral to negative. Um, we have seen that there are a couple of ways to get out ahead of this feeling. Because um, once you've hit this, you've kind of hit the point of no return. There was a point where you should have turned back or done something else. And now the client hasn't received something. There's been a negative impact out in the world, or perhaps the company's image has been affected by someone not getting something done in the proper way. Um, and that lack of trust is now sort of there crackling under the surface. The best thing you can do from here is find a way to move on. And well, there's a tendency to want to sort of unpack everything and talk about what went wrong. Often, that is a very difficult conversation to have when a lack of trust is present. Um, 
people are going to be watching very carefully for does the other side take responsibility did they take responsibility well if they don't then i'm not going to because my feelings were hurt too etc you get into a very negative habit so really i often find the best thing in these sorts of situations to say like all right that happened what are we going to do next time and look to sort of manage people into uh, a better relationship um and what that often comes from is being able to set expectations. So one of the great expectations that could have been set there is simply asking the junior consultant, hey, do you think that you can do everything that we're asking you to do here? How much of this is possible for you? And actually trying to meet them where they're at. The senior consultant is going to be in a much better position to be able to handle extra client work or find someone to partner with them within the organization to do that extra client work. Um, this is why onboarding is so important and kind of like training people is so important um, because you don't want to create these situations where someone's skill is sort of being called into question that strongly, um, especially when they're just starting out and need to be able to learn how the company does things specifically and, and all of the work that that's expected of. You can, that way you can draft accurate estimations of, of workload and, and timeline. Um, and avoid situations like that. And if the senior consultant is like, look, it makes me anxious if we can't get things out to the client ahead of time. Do you think you could help me and just tell me how much you can do? That will probably make the junior consultant feel much safer and able to say like, oh, wow, thank you for saying that. Um, yeah, I feel like I can handle these certain tasks and um, they'll rise to meet them. All right. <sighs> Wonderful. Okay. So I want to talk about a tool that we found. One of the main problems is that um, we found it can be hard to uh, for people to be able to have like a neutral way to self-assess or communicate with one another about their strengths and weaknesses differences, um, kind of who they are um, and what they need from their coworkers, um, what they're good at, what they're bad at, et cetera. Um, and in many cases, we don't take the time to reflect and, and see what um, kind of what people's natural abilities are um, and what our own abilities are. So we started to look into employing this tool as a way to build deeper trust on teams that we want to work closely together. Um, the key advantage with the Myers-Briggs type indicator is that, um, especially on a team that's just forming and getting to know each other, it's a great way for people to sort of share who they are. This builds empathy and understanding and kind of that thing I was talking about originally of kind of knowing what people's strengths are. And when there's trust in place, being able to sort of pitch something to someone's strength and know that it's something that they like doing. It's something that they want to do often. It's their zone of genius. Um, and knowing what those things are can help a manager a lot, but also if the team is aware of these things for each other, um, that can help with that sort of trust building side of things as well. Um, and not think that someone might just be bad at something like, oh, this person's bad at managing their calendar. Like, why can't they figure it out? It's easy for me. Why is it, why is it trouble for them? Um, this builds that kind of compassion for that. If someone has a different strength than you, it probably means that they have some weaknesses that might be strengths for you. Um, so we started employing this um, in Xbm with teams and found that this was hugely uh, beneficial. Um, if you've done Myers-Briggs before, you might have, say, taken an exam online and seen like, oh, okay, well, it's given me some certain results. I'm extroverted. I'm, I'm whatever. And then you read your report and you move on with your life. Um, to me... And, and kind of from my experience facilitating with people, um, the use is not often as much like in the exam or the report. 
the really juicy stuff comes in uh, the conversation as a group about our preferences and what that means about how we work. Um, so what I do with groups, and I'll go into this a little bit later, is, is I'll, I, I have them take the, the report, but I don't share the results of their report with them. Um, I just have them take it and then I get the list of um, potential types based on what the report said. Um, and I say potential because people, there are a lot of things that influence us when we're filling out a report like that. And it can sometimes be difficult to sort through um, sort through why we're answering a question a particular way. Often if we're answering it in a work context, we might say things that we expect the company wants to hear. Or we might just think about ourselves only in work, which requires us to sort of behave and act certain ways. Um, so the problem with that is people will change themselves or shift what they naturally prefer, often unconsciously, um, just because uh, they or we are, are answering something kind of for work um, and not thinking about ourselves maybe in a more holistic sense. Um, so I take the results of the report and that's very important. Um, and I kind of put that off to the side because um, that'll be useful for people to reflect on later and then get the team together and then take the time to, to talk with them uh, about the different preferences and have people start to speculate on which ones might be the best fit for themselves. Um, in this group conversation, uh, I'll, I'll often start and lead and say like, okay, I'm going to tell you what it means to be an extrovert and what it means to be an introvert. And I want you all to think about which one sounds more like you. Don't think about who you are or you, who you have to be at work. Think about who you are on a weekend or when you're having fun or when there's no expectations that are being laid on you. Just think about your natural preference, nothing else. Um, and this freedom has people have light bulb moments about who they are and what they really like. It creates a greater level of self-acceptance for, for kind of ourselves and what, what we naturally are drawn to. Um, it becomes easier for people to communicate their needs, either being a high contact person or a low contact person. Some people, extroverts, really prefer high contact. Talk to me a lot. Let me know what you're thinking. Introverts might want more space and need that low contact, just as an example. Um, and then also through this, people's strengths become very clear. And if a team's been working together for a while, they're going to have a big database, like internal data bank of experiences with these people and be able to go, oh yeah, wow, you really do do amazing work when you're on your own, or you really are good at detail-oriented tasks and you know, et cetera. Um, so it sort of changes the paradigm from I need to change myself to fit into what's expected to, I just need to be able to explain who I am and what I'm good at. Um, so that is it. So Myers-Briggs as a theory is broken up into these four different preference pairs. Um, and pairs of preferences. So each pair would indicate that you either prefer one or the other. And this is because you can kind of only be doing one at a time. Yes, you can go back and forth from being introverted and reflecting to being extroverted and talking, but you can only, you can't do both at the same time. And all of these sort of fit into those, like all, all of these work the same way. So the question that we're trying to answer is not measure, like are you 70% extrovert and 30%, that's not what this is about. The question is really just which do you prefer overall? Which one in your natural state do you like the most? Um, that, that tends to end, like yield the most interesting results. So with all of these, it kind of comes down to these four key questions of how do you direct and receive energy? How do you take in information? How do you decide and come to conclusions? And how do you approach 
the outside world. That's that you could also say like, how do you um, make plans or work on projects is another way that they could kind of look at this one. And with each of those, I, I would hope that you can already start to see how knowing these things about each other would be really useful in a business context when you are making decisions about what to do, when you are planning projects and when you are presenting information and then how often and to whom you are presenting that information and in what ways. All of these things start to really have an impact on how a team functions um, almost like as an organism. Um, if you'll run with the metaphor. Um, but it's very practical knowing these things about each other and all of a sudden they become things that you can leverage again and again, no matter what the project is that you're working on and what skills everyone's bringing to the table, these central things make it possible to really get the most out of it. And when people are working in a way that they prefer, they tend to feel more fulfilled which means that as a boss, you get retention. And when people feel fulfilled, they'll tend to go the extra mile and really kill it on what they're doing, kind of for the intrinsic joy of doing that thing. Um, so yeah, that's a little big picture, but that's how we apply that. Um, so this is just an outline of how I run this with groups. Um, I have folks, like I said, take the indicator. Why'd you do that? Take the indicator. Uh, then we get together and receive a background on the theory, and we go through what I call a group feedback session, which is basically what I was just describing, where I talk through all the different sort of distinctions of the, of the preference pairs and let people talk and say, like, yeah, I think I'm an introvert. <laughs> like, I know I am. Like, and, and, like, here's this example from my life. Um, when I'm with my brother or my family, like, I love him, but I can only take him for so long. And then I really feel better when I can read a book. I mean, that's super bland, but but people, it, it's really amazing when people actually do start to share because, because they're sharing what's true for them and what really works, what makes them happy. Um, so as people start to share, also people with similar preferences kind of can uh, relate to each other in a very positive way over that. New friendships and relationships can develop or it can at least become a little bit deeper. And that means they're gonna be more likely to be able to ask each other for help when they need it and know who they can go to on the team who's gonna understand them and their specific biases. Um, and uh, yeah, it overall helps what I would call kind of like the, the health of the team dynamic. Um, so, uh, number four, I'll tend to leverage breakout rooms and paired sharing. So I'll put people in breakout rooms with each other. And this is really great because, um, in the breakout rooms, I'll, I like, you know, I'll put all the extroverts in a breakout room, all the introverts in a breakout room and let them talk with each other and about how they like to work and then come back and share. And then the group again has time to talk about these things and, and collect, um, kind of what what their discoveries are. Um, then at the end, I'll show them what they reported on their uh, indicator, which is a really big step because it gives them the chance to sort of reflect and go, huh, why did I answer the questions the way that I did on the indicator? Was it really true for me or was I saying what I thought people wanted to hear or you know, what, whatever? Um, and it can be really interesting to see if there's a difference between the type that they think they are after a feedback session and the type that they reported on the indicator. And then they're given a chance to sort of choose which one of those two feels like the best fit for themselves. Um, once they choose that best fit, then I send them a breakdown sheet that talks about their type and a lot of interesting things, growth points, strengths, how they handle relationships, um, really fascinating stuff, uh, kind of for everyone, um, no matter what your type is. And then after they read their breakdown sheets, we'll have another conversation. Usually I'll start to move into talking about weaknesses of the different types here because we've established kind of an objective way to talk about it. Anyway, I hope I'm not going into too much detail here. Um, at, the, at the end though, really discussing those takeaways I think is, is key and being able to come back to that um, usually in two weeks or something and, and have ways to check in and make sure that like, after a couple of weeks, is this still finding its way into, into your work life? Um, cool. And for those of you listening, I want to give you an opportunity to sort of do this for yourselves. Um, 
So this is um, the extrovert and introvert uh, page. And I'm gonna talk about the difference between these two types or these two types of preferences. And while I do this, um, take some time and uh, reflect for yourself if one or the other speaks to you personally more in terms of who you are out in the world. Um, so if you are an extrovert, there's, there's gonna be a tendency to act before thinking. It's going to feel more natural to you to jump into a situation and learn by doing. Um, whereas if you're in a space that's more reflective or more quiet, you might find that to be a less productive space for you than just getting in there and making things happen because you can really learn and draw things out of those situations, get real value and energy for yourself um, going forward. You're also going to get a lot of benefit from talking things through. It's a similar thing to, to kind of jumping in wine, take action. You're going to get a lot out of kind of mixing it up and having a conversation with someone and exploring all of these ideas in dialogue. Um, versus just being on your own and kind of reflecting might not be a place where you're going to have those really brilliant ideas or, or breakthroughs. Mm. There's also just naturally going to be a tendency to be more expressive when you're interacting with others. Um, and you're going to know that you gain in energy from interactions. Those are going to feel really um, positive, really big for you. Um, you'll walk away from those feeling ready to do work and ready to kind of like plow ahead. Um, so that's kind of the extroverted side. You can see all the little arrows are bouncing off the outside of it. The introverted side is much more uh, internal. And so there can be a very rich and clear internal world. That space of reflection for an introvert is gonna be a place of power. It's gonna be a place of, um, clarity. It's going to be where really good ideas are going to come to you. It's going to be a place where um, the work that you need to do feels very achievable. Um, and spending that time in quiet and in reflection is going to be like, again, it's going to be a strong zone. People who prefer this will tend to want a very quiet, undisturbed work environment, one where there's not a lot going on and they can totally focus on their internal world and not be drawn out into the external world where things are going on. Um, you're gonna wanna think things through before you act and really carefully put that together um, and then feel that you can take action and then go back into reflection um, also, someone like this is going to be more contained when they're interacting. So you might notice someone who's introverted simply by looking at them and knowing that they don't give a lot of facial expressions and stuff, which can be really tough for extroverts, uh, speaking as one myself, um, where you really want that feedback. You want to know that they're listening to you to kind of draw your energy from, um, but there just might be a little bit less to, to give or less of a feeling uh, need to, to give in that way. Um, and uh, yeah, tends to gain energy from concentrating on a long task. So um, I hope that you have speculated a bit about this. Um, if you want to put in the comments of the YouTube video, um, which one you are and uh, kind of why you think you're that, or if you're watching this on Zoom with us, uh, putting that in the chat, um, this is where it starts to get really interesting is talking about which one you are and why and what you're drawn to. So that is uh, introversion, extroversion. Cool, I wanna talk about another tool that we used here. Um, these are tabletop role-playing games. I referenced this a bit in the beginning of the talk. Um, so this is, you can see these people kind of like rolling dice and there's other folks on Zoom here. Um, it's a storytelling game that involves kind of everyone being together um, 
and telling a story that's led by one particular individual. It's a bit like a, a director and a bunch of actors um, in, in a sense. Um, there are a number of famous people who do this. Um, you might recognize a few, um, Stephen Colbert, Stephen King, uh, Vin Diesel, uh, Felicia Day. These folks are all, um, all players of, of tabletop role-playing games, and, and the most famous tabletop role-playing game is called Dungeons & Dragons, which you might have heard of. It's a game of, of fantasy and uh, fighting monsters and going in on these like long journeys. Um, very heroic, very like Lord of the Rings-esque with, with magic and, and magical items and curses and uh, ancient temples and things like that. Um, and through that sort of mythic lens, people have often found that they're able to grow very, very deeply in this world. That although the experiences are imaginary, they are very real. And people often report and say, like, you can't tell me that that time that I saved my friend's life from an ogre didn't really happen. Because frankly, it feels just as real as many of the other memories I've had in my life. And I know that it felt significant for me. Um, and that's a very fascinating thing about the brain in that like things that are imagined and deeply felt are often sort of indistinguishable. It's, it's, it's like a simulation, um, but it's very much a storytelling game, one where we all just get together and tell the story and play these characters and, and make choices. And each person who plays um, makes their own character. So you could look at this list of celebrities and imagine a fantasy version of them, for example. Um, and uh, one of them might be a thief. One of them might be a warrior. One of them might be... Uh, <laughs> Uh, a witch with a small owl familiar that that follows them around. It, there, there's a lot of different sort of possibilities. Um, and when everyone shows up to the table, um, you kind of get to put everything else away and say, for these few hours, we're not going to be John from accounting and uh, Kylie from marketing. Um, we're going to be a Johnny, the bear, and uh, Kethmar, the elf. And we're gonna put on these kind of, we're gonna roll these silly dice and stuff, and we're gonna find the space. Now for one, I have found that can be very healthy just to do. Helps people relate to each other as people, and takes a lot of the stress that we normally feel and lets that wash away. Um, but also it can be very cool because the experiences that they have there can be really profound for their own personal growth and the development of their relationships. Like I said, if they save each other's lives in the game, it's not all that different from them saving each other on a project. And the positive feelings from that game tend to spill out. So we started doing this and A, it was incredibly fun for people to do. Um, and they like couldn't get enough of it. And then B, um, it really was building these relationships such that in sort of like the, the hierarchical model of a company where normally people are sort of siloed off, there was almost this backdrop of other relationships that were developing in the network. So people who wouldn't normally relate to each other started building those connections. Um, and we started having a lot more interdepartmental collaboration. It's really exciting. Um, so these are some of the feedbacks uh, that we've gotten. I'll give you a chance to read this while I'm sort of drinking my water. So we've begun to offer this externally for other folks um, because it was so fun and so so productive for us. Um, we feel that a lot of companies can benefit from this in terms of the, the building each other as a team, in terms of giving something back to your employees that they'll find to be really valuable, um, in terms of people expressing their own creativity and kind of joy with each other. It's, it's a really cool bonding experience that does more than your typical team building activity does. It, it does a lot more um, in the sense that that it will take you right out of your roles and put you in a totally new one and learn that you can rely on each other and that 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 much more could be possible than you thought with these folks. Um, so uh, 
yeah, that's that is why we've offered it. Um, let's see here. Yeah, uh, so the bottom right one, our team had an extremely positive experience. That was one of the clients who worked with externally. I've learned a lot more about my team. I remember that person um, being particularly impressed uh, with uh, one of the players who wrote into the story about his character that he felt very connected to his mom and, and very close to her. And, and in the story, he wrote that his mom had passed away and that you know, he was kind of fighting for her and what she stood for. Um, and uh, this other player shared that that he didn't know that. And they ended up connecting after work and actually finding out that that his mom, um, his, his real mom didn't pass away, but um, his real mom uh, was an activist and did a lot of work in her community. And he really looked up to her. And so in that sense, he learned something very valuable, valuable about who kind of his team member was and what his values were. Um, so yeah, we thought that that was really great. Um, and then, yeah, the importance of working as a team to complete one mission. Really, this game, in terms of the challenges you face, can only be accomplished when everyone is using their individual skills, like in a very involved way in collaboration. Um, and reinforcing that, if that's already something that you have on your team, this is just kind of another avenue for your team to explore that. And we found that was really, really great. Um, so yeah, it's very much kind of like campfire storytelling. One person leads and the others uh, contribute. Um, this also was really profound. We had one person share after participating in a, in a couple of sessions um, that uh, she enjoyed the fact that she was able to put herself in her character's shoes. Even though there's a lot of storytelling involved in the development of each character, I think our own personalities are meshed into it. Uh, my character really resonates to who I am, and it was nice that everyone on the team supported and accepted me. Um, I do think that's key. Um, there's this thing with with acting and stories and and character, where um, even if we play a character who's wildly different than ourselves and who we are, we're always going to put a little bit of ourselves into it. It's how we relate to it. And you're sort of putting yourself out there in that way. Um, and when people play, they'll, they'll find that, um, they'll find they can almost in some cases be more themselves because there's this veil of a character in front of them. So they can put more of themselves out there than they otherwise would. They can share more of their feelings. They can share more of their, their preferences and dislikes and quirks. Um, and so it's this nice thing of it being one remove away. And when this is done in partnership with the Myers-Briggs exercise, it can be very powerful because then kind of the meta aspect is a little bit more evident to everyone playing. And that sort of acceptance of who we all are and what makes us all different and unique and learning to celebrate those differences starts to come through and become a part of a team's culture. Um, and when things become nurturing like that, again, trust is going to be very, very strong. People are going to feel very safe leaning into each other, building off of each other's ideas, knowing what works and doesn't work um, for the team and knowing how to inspire each other. Um, but, but you get that fundamental layer of trust and, and, and that, as I said, kind of earlier in the talk can be leveraged in a number of ways to, to really make your team high performing. Um, so we found that although this is kind of a game and a bit of a side thing, it has produced really great effects for, for our team's ability to collaborate with themselves and with each other. Um, so that's about it. Um, we have a handful of different packages and I think we actually need to update this slide. Um, but you can schedule sessions with us. Uh, we really recommend the three session package. We find that that's kind of just the right amount of time to be able to get the most out of one of these games. Um, if you, uh, like if you want kind of the bonds to develop on a deeper level and people start to really learn things about each other, we find that three sessions is really great. Um, but if you do book it, know that we send uh, packages that have dice in them as well as, um, dice as well as snacks to sustain people through their journey and do, do 
Yes, so we have those. Um, so we recommend the three session package. We also have a single session package, which we call like our storming, like the storming, norming, and performing are kind of our three big packages. Um, storming is one session, norming is three, and performing is um, seven. That's kind of a really big one. Um, but we've run that to great effect. And um, yeah, so yeah, one session can be very effective, but sometimes it'll just more unearth what's going on already. And then I can give recommendations and stuff for where to take it, but then I'll sort of hand the reins off to the team lead and, and um, have a consultation call afterwards to make sure you got something out of it. That's a part of all of these is that uh, this, this last bullet here is a consultation call one-on-one -on -one between me and the team lead. Um, sort of talk about what we saw and what what might exist for the team in terms of how you can you know coax things out and, and get the most uh, best performance out of your team given what we might have learned through playing together. Um, and with each game that we do, um, each session, uh, they're half day sessions, and we'll do an exercise in the beginning to get into character. We'll play and then at the end do sort of a retrospective about like what worked and what didn't work. Um, I just did one of these the other week and. Um, found that the team was actually able to negotiate really well how they want to converse over Zoom because they were all very excited and they started to kind of overlap each other and cut each other off. And I could tell that, that was frustrating for them. And so when I said, hey, is there anything you guys want to talk about? One of the players brought up that frustration and apologized if he interrupted his teammate. And they created a working agreement around kind of interrupting each other, which is great because A, it shows the team was very engaged in the process of play that they wanted to interrupt each other. They were like, no, 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 I've got to get my point in. This really matters. You know, the stakes felt high. Um, and then given that they created an agreement for remotely, how are we going to do that? And that um, in their next session, smoothed things out so much. Because uh, I know that as a team lead, you really want your team to be engaged and participating. Um, if this is a bit of a side note, but if you struggle with that and have trouble getting people to engage and participate in your meetings, I have um, another webinar on conflict that I highly recommend checking out. This webinar on conflict talks about how to engage people and that conflict is one of the things that we use to create engagement. Think about any good movie that you watch. Immediately at the beginning, the conflict is evident. Darth Vader is hunting plans and um, Princess Leia wants to get out of there and not let him get it by any means. That is the conflict that's established at the beginning of Star Wars. Um, and it's that conflict that draws you in as a viewer and makes you want to engage even though you're just watching people on a screen. They're not you. Um, and so conflict is one of the great ways to create engagement. So if you're really interested in that, I highly recommend checking out my other talk. Um, anyway, going back to this, um, so that is essentially what each session looks like. And in the first session and kind of at the beginning of each one, um, we'll do uh, one form of introductions. I'll go over the mechanics, talk about the plot and, and our working agreement. Um, and this is just, it's just a, a it, it on the first session, we'll spend more time on this. And then each day after that, it's more of kind of a refresher um, just to make sure that people are, are aware of these things. Um, and as we get to know each other better, the introductions obviously matter less and less. Um, and, and as we get to know the game mechanics, similarly, it becomes less and less important. Um, and then we can really focus on play and character and what we're, how we're growing and what we're learning um, through the experience, which is, again, why that seven session package is so effective. Um, because by the end of it, I'm spending almost no time talking about this. People have sort of integrated the working agreement into their bones. Um, they've integrated some of the key skills of listening and call and response. Um, and it becomes a very, you know, th those last few sessions can be very, very productive, the, the retrospectives at the end of those, um, which is really what we're gunning for. My goal with all of these is to get a team to be able to perform at its absolute best, um, kind of on that interpersonal or like dynamics level. Um, and I certainly get a lot of joy out of it, seeing a team flourish. So that's how it works in terms of the, the structure and mechanics of, of play. Um, so 
on a bigger scale, um, I am a part of XBM, uh, a Valiantis company, a platinum solution partner of Atlassian. And we focus on my element of team building because teams and teamwork is so essential to the Atlassian suite of products. Literally, Jira is built on teams. It's built uh, with Scrum and Kanban functionality is like front of mind. Um, so we know that these soft skills or dynamic skills really feed a, re a very well-constructed and configured workflow and a very well-trained workforce in the structure of Agile. Um, so we offer consulting on a high level. We offer training for anyone in the company, and we also offer custom development solutions to make sure that your products work exactly the way that you want them to. Um, that means add-ons, custom integrations, APIs, um, custom front ends uh, for Atlassian products. These are these are really useful tools for your for your Jira instance, um, and uh, we believe that like uh, like uh, tailored consulting is really the like uh, one of the most effective things for a company to truly thrive. And our goal at the end of the day is to give you everything you need, such that we can walk away and you can have uh, the company that is working the way that you intend it to. Um, so that's it. Uh, we have some upcoming webinars, but this is out of date. So I'm going to pull up another one here. If you want to check out our custom upcoming webinars, you go to xbm.com and you click on training. Then we scroll down. Mm. So these blue ones are, are free, uh, free things that you can sign up. You can see there's my provoking productive conflict. Uh, June 27th, no, that's today. That needs to be updated. Um, and let's have a look here. I think uh, these green ones are paid classes. So things like Atlassian governance, um, learning a quick start on assets, advanced roadmaps, really, really good stuff for, for if you're trying to get the most out of your, your JIRA's instance. There's our Myers-Briggs team workshop. Um, so down here, um, this is kind of our setup again. I think that this is incorrect, um, but everything else here is accurate. Um, and you can see that we have uh, introduction to Confluence, um, JIRA work management for all, which is great for non-software teams and non-support teams. Um, and uh, JIRA Bootcamp, which is kind of our flagship product. Um, I'll be doing the same talk again on July 27th. So if you have anyone that you want to attend that, please reach out. Um, and I will make sure that the accurate dates for provoke, produ provoking productive conflict are set up on here. All right. So with all of that, thank you guys for uh, listening. This has been a real pleasure to deliver to you. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed listening and come out of it with something useful. If you want to find me, um, you can find me on LinkedIn by just searching my full name. Um, I post there a lot, talk about these concepts. Um, and if you want to email me, you can email me at joshua.selesnik at xpm.com or just joshua.selesnik at xpm.com. Um, and you can grab a quick screenshot of this uh, if you want to know. So I believe that's everything. Let me check the messages. Do, do, do. Yep. All right. That is everything. Guys, thank you so much for attending. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.